Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. People think that design is styling. Design is not style. It's not about giving a shape to the shell and not giving a damn about the guts. Good design is a renaissance attitude that combines technology, cognitive science, human need and beauty to produce something that the world didn't know it was missing. I'm quoting the guest of today. She's an Italian author, editor and curator. She's currently the senior curator of the Department of Architecture and Design, as well as the director of R&D and the Museum of Modern Art of New York City. She has curated numerous shows, lectured worldwide, served on architecture and design juries, taught at multiple universities, and received honors including the Art Director Hall of Fame and the 2015 AIGA Medal. And she was rated as one of the most powerful women in art by Art Review and Surface Magazine. Paola Antonelli, Welcome to In Your Shoes. Thank you, Mauro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Paola, in full disclosure, is also a very good friend. Yes, uh, and, for... and it's kind of hard to speak in English in this podcast, <laughs> but we'll do our best. We can use our accents and just we, make we, it... It's a video podcast, so we can yeah, use yeah. our hands Perfect. as well. Okay, good. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> but So, actually, let's start from there. We're both Italians. Yeah. We both come from the provincia. I come yeah. from Varese. You come from I don't Sassari, come from the provincia. Right? I come from Milan, honey. What, but yeah, you were born I was born family? in Sassari, but I'm Milanese. I was born in Sassari. I'm very proud to be Sardinian. But I was there because my father was a university professor and a surgeon. And so he had been sent to Sassari at that time. And so I was born there very, very proudly. And when did you move back to Milan, by the way? Well, for, after two years in Sassari, we moved to Ferrara, which is a great city near Bologna. And uh, we lived there for five years. And my sister was born there. And then we moved back to Milan. How did you end up then in the United States? Well, um, you know, I like to say that I never really made a decision. It all happened, and it's true. You know, the only decision that I truly made was to switch. At some point, I was at the Bocconi. I was doing economic and social disciplines, and I switched to architecture. That was the only decision. But then things happened really organically, and uh, I moved to the United States because I was working on the International Design Conference in Aspen. It was an, an, an issue, it was an episode that was about Italy, it was 1989. And when I got to Aspen, you know, I, there was the AV guy, there was the surfer from Malibu, and so, <laughs> and so I started going to LA, and nothing ever happened with the guy, but I started teaching at UCLA, so it all happened very organically. And um, for about three years, I was going back and forth between Italy and California. And then I got the position at moment, so I moved to New York. How did it happen? Did it happen? Um, and an ad in a magazine, something that to Italians is impossible to comprehend. I saw an ad in a magazine and I sent my application. Oh, really? Yes, I sir. didn't know this part of the story. Yes, absolutely. I knew already the curators at MoMA because I had interviewed them for Domus, but I had no experience in museums. I had curated exhibitions before, but you know, it's uh, it, it was truly answering an ad in a magazine. And why do you say that it's weird for Italian to conceive this? What What is unique to America from that standpoint? Well, I don't know if it's unique to America, it might be unique also elsewhere, but um, it, there was no recommendation. There was no previous, knowledge or acquaintance or like groups of friends or or like a clique or a clan or a court which is usually what happens a lot in Italy and you know it happens a lot and I don't mean to put down Italy but that's why when I say to Italians most Italians are surprised granted sometimes also Americans but it's really um it was based not only on merit, it was truly the person that hired me, Terry Riley, that had a lot of guts. Because I had never worked in a museum before, I did not have a PhD, I had only a master's, you know, it's in architecture, not in, not in history. So it was really, he, he took a chance. 
Who was your first project and mama? The first project, so I was hired in 94, and uh, the very first project was an exhibition that happened in 95 that was entitled Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. The idea behind it was something that you know very well in your field. Up until the 90s, most designers and architects, but especially designers, had to accept as materials, whatever was offered to them by the chemical industry or by you know, the timber industry. So there was no way to kind of customize. And right around that time with the advent of composites and with new resins that could cure at ambient temperature, all of a sudden designers themselves could design the materials. So it was really about moving the center of gravity of the design process further up, you know, a monte, you know, so yeah. it was really powerful. And uh, I wanted to show how design was changing because of that. So it, it was an exhibition that was divided in groups of materials, and you had plastics, glass, ceramics, wood. So the way you would imagine it, and it was showing objects that were either made with innovative materials or that were using old materials in an innovative way. It was a very inspiring exhibit. And oh, you saw it? I, well, I ah. didn't see the exhibit, but I'm going to tell you a story that probably I, did, I never told you. In 1998, I was in Dublin, studying at the National College of Art and Design. Ah, and it was, nice. you know, I was coming from Polytechnic or this big university. Yeah, which I went that one, to. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that one was a pretty small one, very small classes. And this, I remember one day, like it was yesterday, but for real, I walk in the room and there was the book of your exit yeah. there. That's so how I met you virtually for That's the so first nice. time. Yeah. And I was fascinated by the cover, by the title mostly. And, mm -hmm. and I started to look at the book and I learned about the exhibit about you in that way. So oh, that was my nice. first contact. Yay. And then later on, uh, one main contact you're aware of this time is you have been you work on another exhibit, uh, Master Humble, master Humble masterpiece. Masterpieces. Yes. And back then I was working at 3M, the company of Post-it. Post-it was one, Post-it yes. notes were one of the products there. But that exhibit is very close to my heart because in a way or the other, I found myself working all these years in products that somehow are humble, are not, you know, high design. Uh, well, they are high design. But in a completely because, different yes, way. Exactly. They're not in the traditional definition of high yeah. design, but the definition mm -hmm. that you have and that I have yeah, of high exactly. design. Can you tell me more about your point of view on well, this? Well, first of all, I just want to tell you something funny about the post-it note because right now there's a MoMA just published on the magazine a special article about the post-it note and it ends <laughs> with a picture that I took many years ago for an official, I think it was Business Week, in which I am basically wearing, as if it were a Pierre Cardin, all of post-it notes. It's very funny from 2000 five or three, I don't know. So uh, it's hilarious. But <laughs> So my philosophy is this. Um, what could be more valuable than to make a masterpiece that can be acquired, bought, used by as wide a number of people as possible, and that is elegant and useful, and you can relate to it. You know what I'm saying? That's to me the highest form of design. It's very easy to make a curly cute chair, you know, and to make to ask fifty thousand dollars for it. It's much harder to make something that costs one dollar. So that particular exhibition, which was called Humble Masterpieces of Design, you know, Humble Masterpieces, had of course the post-it note, but it also had it had the aluminum can without PepsiCo on it, but it had the aluminum can. It had jelly beans and M&Ms. It had um, just these gorgeous objects. It had uh, the chupa chups. I mean, it had a lot of food also, and the big pen and the big lighter. So all of these objects that are part of everybody's life and they're so ubiquitous that you don't even see them anymore. But when you think about living without them, they leave a they leave a hole. Yeah. You know. So that's to me the most valuable design that there is. And do you think there is more awareness today about the role of design, both in the, des there are two communities, the design communities, that the design community realize what we can do, the potential we have. And then there is the business community. Uh, yes, there is more awareness, but it's not yet really intuitive. 
And see, that's the problem. So it also depends on the culture. So if you, if you go to Italy, there is an awareness of design, but it's very much about style. You know well, because you've dealt with Italians. There are these great companies that I'm so proud of and that do wonderful work, but they always have to talk about luxury. They ha always have to talk about, between quotes, made in Italy. And it's a place where you have uh, companies like the Aletti and the Mocha or Al Alessi that has a line that is in all bars all over the world. So they're very powerful in Italy about humble masterpieces, but the humble masterpieces are a little bit hidden. They only want to show the so-called luxury items. Then you go to the UK, there's a lot of awareness of design and in a way it's more towards engineering and that kind of innovation. So they're very proud of their cars. Well, so are we, but they have a different kind of uh, attitude. When it comes to the United States, you still have to really pack it package design for the business community. Um, you have to show examples like PepsiCo, you have to show examples like Apple, you have to show examples like 3M. You have to tell them design is important for business. They do not accept design as a cultural value that is essential to the destinies of society. You have to filter it through business. And my ambition, it's always been that way ever since I came here, is to make design normal. You know, like normal. And that's, that's sorry, I'm talking too much, but um, mm. <laughs> you know, every country or every place has a strength. So if you come to New York, it's contemporary art. I came here, I had no clue. Uh, I had studied architecture at the Polytechnical IQ. We stopped at Dada. After Dada, there was nothing. And all of a sudden I come here and even my friend's son who was like three and a half, four, received children's galleries invitations, right? Uh, in Latin America, in many parts of Latin America, the normal is great modern architecture. So you go to any architect or geometra and they design for you a little home that's perfectly modern. In Italy, it's design. So these are the different strengths that are normalcy. And, and, and then fast forward into today. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, you imagine and produce an amazing, beautiful exhibit on on a human crisis, broken nature yeah. is, is a theme that is very close to our heart in PepsiCo. We are investing a lot, especially in the past few years with the new CEO on sustainability. Can you tell us more about broken nature? So broken nature was um, the 22nd Triennale di Milano. The Triennale di Milano is both a building and an institution. It, it's the, it's the 22nd um, edition, so it's been going on for a really long time. And it's also the building where I started my career, so it was very emotional with my parents alive that could see it. But enough of personal history, let's go to the exhibition. So as the title says, it's about how we have broken uh, nature. And um, it's about the concept of uh, when you break something, you own it, number one. And number two, when you break something, it will never be whole again, it will be something else. So it is at the same time a pessimistic and an optimistic exhibition. It uh, relies on the fact that as a human species, we will become extinct. We will. Uh, we have a little bit of control on the when, and we have quite a bit of control on the uh, how. How can you be so sure that we will? Because yeah. that's what happens to all species. That's what happens to all beings. There's entropy and everything and everybody dies. You know? So even a species dies. So what we should really do is knowing that we're mortal as a species, not only as individuals, we should do what individuals do. We should think of our legacy and we should design a beautiful extinction so that the next species will remember us with a little bit of respect, not as complete morons, right? So, um, so the whole exhibition is about the idea of restorative design. It's about awareness. It's about beauty. It's about sadness, but also about love for other human beings and other species. And it gathers examples of design and also of art that speak to that. It was, um, it was a really um, great experience. It was the first exhibition outside of MoMA that I did in 25 years. So, and also it was the first exhibition that I did in, a, in an institution that is only about design. Because, you know, being at MoMA is a, is a blessing because 
80% of the people that see my shows don't even know about my shows. They're there to see Matisse and Picasso and then they stumble upon them. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, because it's not only about design, you don't, you don't get enough of this audience that is there only for that. And in Milan, of course, you get so many. And you often talk about uh, the purpose of design and, and you, you uh, always um, focus on a variety of different cultural tension. You've been working on the role of design and safety, uh, violence. Uh, what is for you the purpose of design in this society? Can design design a better society, create a better, better society? Sure. Um, not by itself. You know, I think, I believe that only interdisciplinary teams and uh, different cultures coming together can do really can really activate change. But design can do a lot, and the way I use it, it, I use it as a lens to read society. So when you talk about design and safety, there was an exhibition in two thousand four. But the interesting thing is that it became it began in uh, at the end of nineteen ninety nine as an exhibition called Emergency, and I was working on it like really. Mm, intensely when 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden I found that all the objects that I was studying for an exhibition were deployed around me to go and find corpses or uh, to help people. So it was really triage centers. So I had this kind of shock reaction and I decided I didn't want to do the show anymore. I just threw everything away, started working on another show. And then in time, I thought about it as from the other side of the metal. So instead of talking about emergency and response, let's talk about um, safety and therefore like before the fact, right? So, so that was a reaction to what happened in reality and pretty much every exhibition is like that. So design is a way to read society and what goes on in society. Design and violence was a great project online that first was proposed as an exhibition. It was rejected as an exhibition. So together with my co-curator, Jamer Hunt, we decided to put it online and it was even better. But it was prompted by the 3D printed gun. So when the 3D printed gun uh, news hit the internet, I was so shocked by the fact that a technology like 3D printing that I had invested in intellectually and curatorially all of a sudden could be used for evil that I decided to do a whole project on it to understand what happens when good design goes bad, you know? And um, um, Broken Nature is another example and uh, everything is, when you, when you deal with contemporary design, everything comes from reality. You read it and design helps you understand reality better. And so you think, we, what can we do as a society, designers, business people, uh, the governments, you know, the different kind of entities to make sure we're going to design a better world, a world that is not going to be broken until we will extinct, <laughs> we'll be extinct. Yeah, well, we will, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a lot that we can do, and it's funny because just this morning I was thinking about it intensely because I'm writing an essay for the next Biennale of Architecture in Venice, which has as a title, How Will We Live Together? Question mark, which is so interesting. So how, how are we going to do it? And I was thinking of, about this how, and of course, you know, business people can do something, designers can do something, architects, artists, you know, bankers, everybody can do something. But nothing is going to happen if we do not change individual, um, individual awareness and individual intellectual autonomy. It's so easy that I think that the real key to changing things is education. It's educating every single human being to be his, her, their own thinker and not take anything for granted or uh, believe in anything until you prove it. So I'm going back to this kind of enlightenment attitude and I'm sorry it's a little bit anti-religious but it's really what I think is the only solution for every single human being to think for her, him, their themselves. I, I totally agree. In a world where we're so bombarded by information, especially if you think about new generation, kids, young uh, individuals, uh, that they didn't develop yet those filters to interpret those information, to educate them in the right way and give them the tools to understand what's going on and interpret the information and the data that they have. 
to create something positive and purposeful and meaningful for the world is going to be key. I know. I, I think that, however, that the problem is not really the kids. It's the adults that have that think they know. Those are most problematic. I was watching this fabulous television, British television series called Years and Years. It's really excellent. It looks at a British family, kind of a dysfunctional and wonderful British family, in the future over 15 years. Starting today with everything that's happening, more, um, more nationalism, more hatred, more environmental crisis, but at the same time, the advance of technology that helps um, in, instead bridge these gaps. So. It's quite beautiful, and um, and there's a particularly this figure of one of the daughters that wants to implant all of these different chips and ways of communicating and and being online into herself and become transhuman, and it's beautiful. I mean, because you can see that the next generation by using technology but still having a mind of their own can do much more than we can. Actually, we often talk about the negative of what's going on right now, but there is so much positive uh, as well. Uh, if you think, for instance, uh, on, about the fact that anybody today can come up with an idea, get access to funding relatively easily compared yeah. to the past, from yeah. kickstarter.com to the proliferation of all these funds all around the world, hunting for ideas. Cost of manufacturing is going down, driven by yeah. technology. You can go straight to consumers with e-commerce. You can build your ecosystem of communication through social media. So essentially, either these big corporations create something that is extraordinary for people, meaningful for people, or if they don't, anybody Somebody can go will, compete. Hopefully. So this is, a, you know, I call this age we're entering, the age of excellence, a world where either you produce excellence or somebody else will do it for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the counterpart to yeah. the, 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 the digital media platform that are giving uh, a stage to the most basic, uh, visceral instinct of humanity. There is also this positive moment that yeah. we're entering. It's a what really do you think about this? Oh, it's a really interesting moment. I completely agree with you. But I am like you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe that the more fluid and open things are, the more there's going to be the self-adjusting system. So I am for information wants to be free, of course. I'm still uh, thinking of the idealism of the 1960s and 1970s as the best uh, way forward. Of course, it's not that easy, but I am hoping that kids will make it happen. They are really quite amazing online and uh, you know in the, the the character in this television series was just just fantastic it's also probably a democratization of the innovation and design process essentially anybody no matter your background you could be a man or a woman different kind of religion or political yeah. uh, interest you know that anybody can create mm -hmm. something and take it to market mm -hmm. and if the idea is strong and meaningful it will win. Absolutely. So you, you often talk about diversity, for instance, you're a woman in that position. I remember, I think in your Broken Nature exhibit, all your team was women, if I'm not wrong. I mean, yeah. Most of the time you have many, many women in your team and women from different kinds of nationalities, different kinds of backgrounds. What do you think is the role of diversity in innovation? It's fundamental. I cannot even begin to say it. You know, it's like, People say that biodiversity is necessary to the destinies of the world and cultural diversity is necessary to the destinies of society. And cultural diversity is what colors, backgrounds, languages are. You know, it's not anymore about the physical, but it's about the cultural. And, um, you know, I, I run these salons at MoMA. There's this R&D department that consists of salons about topics that are about reality. So we do salons about protest and uh, about anger. Sometimes we also do nice ones, like about angels. <laughs> but um, whenever I compose the people that are gonna speak, I'm sorry, I just, I'm very careful about representing. And it's not only because I wanna be politically correct or woke because that's not even the point anymore. It's beyond that. It's because I want to have a meaningful, meaningful conversation. If you don't have diversity, the conversation is not meaningful. It's like you were asking me before, can design design a better future? Not by itself. Only if there's a diverse fan of disciplines coming together, can you have a meaningful 
uh, project or a meaningful conversation. So diversity is just key to everything. I, I totally agree. Even just if you think about the innovation process, the design process, it's all about looking at the world, looking at reality, uh, looking at something that everybody, millions and millions of people around the world are looking at, but having the ability to have a different kind of point of view, a different kind of perspective and see there something mm -hmm. that nobody ever saw before. So diverse point of views and people with diverse point of views talking with each other and building on each other's point of views give you the possibility to change your perspective and finally drive innovation. It's so at the, at the base of what we do as innovation and design people that it's, it's crazy to think of somebody that can imagine innovation without diversity. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I agree. You mm. mentioned the salon and, you know, as a designer, I totally understand why something like this is hosted by an art and design museum. But many people that don't belong to the design world may, th may think, why an art and design museum is hosting those kind of salon, those kind of topics? Well, the whole department of R&D was born out of the financial crisis in 2008, because as a culture person coming from an economics university, I've always had a chip on my shoulder because politicians and econo economists always think that the financial sector is necessary to the destinies of society together with the industrial sector. So if there's like the big crisis it needs to be rescued and instead the cultural sector, oh my God, so superfluous. There's a problem, we cut the budgets, no responsibility from the government, who cares, right? And instead, I've always thought that culture is, well, not the only one. I mean, there's a whole history of people that say culture is what makes nations and, and people worth defending, right? So 2008, I thought, great, the financial sector revealed its true colors. So now we need to show that museums are the true R&D of society, that culture is what can save uh, everyone. So I went to the director of MoMA, I proposed it, but at that time, we were all taking pay cuts not to fire anyone because it was really a crisis. So um, we waited a few years and then we started this department and it's a lot of R and very little D. But the purpose is really that, to show that a cultural institution like a museum is not just a place where you go and look at pictures and paintings, but it's a place where you go and uh, discuss how to live in the world. So you can go to a museum and talk about death and really talk about death in a personal way. You know, it's like, how do I deal with death? And we had a wonderful salon about that. Or you can, you're, you're puzzled by algorithms. So there was one salon about the way of the algorithm, you know. So it really is about showing, and at every salon, there's like four to six speakers. And at least one of them is an artist. And the others come from all kinds of different disciplines. You know, sometimes they are scientists, sometimes the journalists, I mean, all kinds. The audience also comes prepared because when they say that they're coming, I send them a reading list. So they know that we've done our homework. So you better be serious. And there's a very, very I, I, mature kind of, uh, there's sense of humor, there's everything, but there's a very mature level of participation. I mean, New Yorkers are amazing. They come to the open of an envelope, you know, so, <laughs> and even if there's like a, a storm, a hurricane, once there were trees were falling in Brooklyn and they were, and the theater was full. So I'm always moved by the enthusiasm, but people want to talk in, in New York City and they're not afraid of culture and they know that cultural institutions are places where you can have serious conversations. I wish that we could irradiate the rest of the country. That's not really the case, but maybe one day. How can we do it? I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's easy. I think we can do it only if we start showing respect for people that are not like us. It's as simple as that. You know, it always comes down to respect everything design, politics, science, everything comes down to respect. I remember the New York Times a few months ago did an experiment and they put together people that were really, really diverse culturally, coming from different parts, different um, political parties. They put them together for five days until in the end, they're all, they were all friends, evangelicals and, uh, and queer Democrats from you know San Francisco. They were all talking. So how do we make that happen? That is, it, it would take a real, it would take a real um, invention of a new way of communicating and of a safe space. And I don't know what that safe space can be. I agree. I, I, 
recently I was in Israel where we recently acquired Soda Stream, and it was very interesting because the company is been investing to build a very very diverse base of associates of employees. So you have people with different kind of religion background, all kind of a diverse background, all working together, friendly, hand in hand. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, you think about Israel, Palestine, and the situation there is is just what you say. You put them together, few hours, few days, and they will find a way to connect and communicate. And the problem in Israel, like here, is the extreme wings. Those are the ones that really pull everybody apart. And those are the toughest one to have communicate. Because even in Israel, you know, how many Israeli designers are friends with the Leban Lebanese designers, but they meet at the Salone in Milan. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. They cannot meet in Israel or in, Be in, in Tel Aviv or in Beirut. They meet in Milan. Art <laughs> and design could be a way to connect people. They right? always are. They always are. <laughs> you know, they always are. And talking about this through the salon and in general, art and design is always inspiring for society, for people. You've been inspiring so many people with your work over the years. Thank you. What inspires you? Ooh, I, um, I feel sometimes like a vampire. Um, you know, sometimes I have some moments in which I'm very down. And what picks me up in a second, like a tonico in Italian, is somebody else's creativity. It could be a fabulous television series. It could be an exhibition. It could be a studio visit. I love studio visits. So that immediately gets me going. I am so always flabbergasted by other people's creativity and quality of, of production that, that immediately picks me up of all, of all kinds. I don't think, I'm not a very acoustic person. You know, I, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm right, I'm recording a podcast, but I don't <laughs> listen to podcasts. It's terrible. But anything else pretty much goes. You're curious. Right? Or a great, oh my God, a great restaurant. I mean, anything. What is your relation with the world of food? Did you write a book about food? Or? Well, I, I wrote several articles and I've been writing a book about foods called Design Bites for about... 15 years, <laughs> that, that's the problem. When you have your own project, you don't do anything. My relationship with food is like, oh my God, I love it. And uh, I am very curious with food. I pretty much What do you think is everything. the role of design in the world of food? From oh, consuming food, designing food? It's humble masterpieces. So the kind of design that I'm really interested in is uh, the kind of food design that I'm interested in are not ornate plates. They are the basic units the humble masterpieces. So I just did um, a little video for TED because they do this like um, object-based videos. I did one on pasta. And, and talking again about design and innovation, um, we know that to innovate, to create something that is unique and was never uh, invented before, you need to experiment. And you need to mm -hmm. make mistakes and you need to fail eventually. It's at the base of innovation. I think it's one of the biggest challenges for, especially for big corporations that need to deliver to shareholders. You need, you need, you need yeah, to do everything exactly. right. You cannot it's make true. mistakes. It's difficult, but you need to make mistakes and manage, manage death uh, over, over the years and your portfolio. So in your life, in your professional journey, did you make mistake? What are the failures that taught you something that you remember? You're like, well, I did that and I learned that and something else came out of it. Very few of note, probably so many, but um, I am not very much for the mythology of failure. You know, especially in Silicon Valley, there's this myth of failing well. Eh, failure is not that nice, you know what I'm <laughs> saying? It's like, and the few times that I remember, uh, I keep them private. Like, you know, there are some things that are not even in my resume because they were not failure on the outside. They were more failures on the inside, times when I did not, when I was not happy of what I did. Um, but otherwise, I cannot recall anything. I also have this great um, mechanism. I forget things that are not pleasant where I remove them. And a therapist would say, like, ready to explode <laughs> like a bomb. I'm trying to think if there were, no, and no, 
No failures, not, <laughs> not failures to notice. What about you? Oh, no failure you want to disclose. Well, yeah, no, yeah, but, but it was not even a failure. It was an exhibition that was a big success, but I didn't like it because I didn't have fun. It didn't, it didn't enrich me. So, but that's not a failure, you know? So, well, I mean, you ask about me. Yeah. I, you know, first of all, every time they ask me this question, I'm in the same situation because it's not easy to focus on something notable or. I'm not some, being coy. I just really don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. no. It's and it's a different. It's a difficult question. I, you know, in my case, um, we did so many innovation projects, both at PepsiCo at 3M, that nobody ever saw. They stayed yeah. behind the scenes, and. You know, they're failure because they never arrive anywhere because of a variety of different things didn't align. Even though many of those ideas I think would be phenomenal for the society, for people, the world needs it, but they didn't get there for many different reasons. Yeah, like and the post it note. Like the post it note is one great example. Yeah. To, to, to get to market mm -hmm. in that case, for instance. Yeah. So it's a, uh, you know, it, it, Looking back in my case, and you can call them failure, mistakes, things that didn't work out. Looking back and those projects and events and figuring out why I was not able to take them to market is often a way for me to really understand how to proceed in the future. Right. To approach different Did you projects. see General Magic, the documentary? No. Oh, it's great. So this is a documentary about the company that was a spin-off of Apple that basically developed the smartphone, but way too early. So yeah. nothing happened of it, right? So was that a failure? Yeah, maybe. But then, you know, Tony Fadell went on to do the iPod, you know, just like everybody did something. So they talk about it as a failure in the documentary, which is really fantastic. But I don't know. Or my doing two years of economics, was that a failure? Or was that a wasted time? Not at all. You know what I'm saying? I just... I don't really know what failure is unless somebody dies or unless something truly negative happens on a human level. Um, of course, you need to have the luxury to be able to fail, right? In my case, yeah. I, had, I had parents that afforded the Bocconi, which was pri private university for two years, and then afforded my going to the Politecnico. So, you know, I had that luxury. So if you have the luxury to fail and nobody gets hurt, no problem. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you make me re remember a conversation with our common friend, Karim Rashid, yeah. a few years Karim. ago. <laughs> he mm -hmm. was telling me, imagine our life is like a CD or a floppy disk back then, you know, 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> they were floppy disk. You remember when you were formatting the floppy disk <laughs> yes. and the computer would show you all the data there were, but there were a lot of empty spaces, yes. and then you were compacting Optimi you were optimizing, optimizing it, everything. Yeah. And he was using that as a metaphor for life, you know, and how, you know, if you were focused on the right thing, but probably all those empty spaces are actually, they were necessary to then understand how to manage the rest and be more effective, mm -hmm. more productive, or better in what you do in life, in your work, in the future. It's a, mm -hmm. It was a very interesting analogy. <laughs> So this podcast is called In Your Shoes, and today we were able to enter in your shoes and enter in your mind and understand a little bit of your point of view in the world. So we have oh, our no, you shoes. Have a pair of shoes. Yay. Have, actually, That's it's just a right. it's just a pair of um, uh, slippers. There is also this beautiful bag for the people Ooh, that are looking at Thank you. <laughs> But Paola, thank you again for thank taking the time out of Mauro. your busy schedule. È un piacere. È sempre mm. un piacere parlare con te. È un piacere. Grazie. Grazie a te. <laughs>